of the world. I once rafted down the Dutkozy, spring snowmelt as it raged and roared out of the high Himalaya on its way to join the Ganges in the great Indian plain. And there's the Nile. The source of the Nile, you know, is where Burton always said it was, in the high lake that lay beyond the mountains of the moon. And this is the Neen where it joins the wash. Oh, well. Actually, it's more interesting than you might think. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't have crocodiles lurking hopefully near the funeral pyres at Varanasi, and you won't find Ramses II's temple complex at Abu Simbel looming above its waters, but I can show you a hippo at Whittlesea and a hidden bit of Peterborough Cathedral as we follow the Neen from sea to source. Mind you, one thing that does loom above its waters is beautiful enough in its own way and definitely well worth the cycle. Sad soul that I am, I am one huge fan of that Fenland wonder, the Cross Keys Bridge. There have been three bridges here. The Swing Bridge was built in the 1890s by the same engineers who made Tower Bridge. And those of us who remember the swing in 60s know that in those days it carried more than portly presenters pretending they'd cycled all the way from the wash to Sutton Bridge. You see, right up to the eve of the 60s, the steam locomotives of the Midland and Great Northern Railway would shake, rattle and roll right across it. Hello, Wizard Barlett, uh, Sutton Bridge. What have we got on today's time, please, over? Cross Keys Bridge is man-operated, and 20 years ago, that man was a dark-haired, denim-clad chap called John Barker. 20 years on, he's still perched up in his shed in the sky, and though his hair's a bit greyer, his jeans still fit him. Must be all those stairs. I was amazed that you still man this 24 hours a day, don't you? Yes, we're manned for the reason being that the tides are every 12 hours, and two tides every 24, you see and they go around an hour at a time. And as shipping can only use the tide when it's high tide and not at low water, because it's insufficient water in the river. Of course. Um, we have to follow the tide. We would have to follow the tides around. It must be lovely just sitting up here at two or three in the morning. Uh, yes, it's, it's got its assets. It's, uh, <laughs> depends what time of year it is, really. It well, yeah, be... in the winter, it'd be a bit chilly. Those lorries don't half shake this bridge, don't they? Yeah, they certainly do. But it's not actually doing any damage to it? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's OK as long as you don't spill the tea. <laughs> <laughs> How many ships in the course of a year use this now? Well, we, uh, cargo vessels between 50 and 55. And then, of course, we get other crafts as well, which is the tugs plying up and down between the two ports fishing vessels, not many of those now, and, of course, quite a number of yachts. So it's not really a lot at the end of the day, is it? I'm not only really. curious, because I've seen, whenever I come up the A17, I've seen with yeah. unerring accuracy to coincide with the fact that you've got the bridge open to let a boat through, because I always yeah. end up sitting in a queue of traffic. <laughs> well, you're very lucky. There's <laughs> lots of people who'd like to see it never have the opportunity. Actually, well, that, that brings <laughs> me nicely onto something else, because I was going to be really cheeky and ask, could I open it? <laughs> Well, of course you can open it. Why not? Push that. Push that one. Bring this one back. Just a kid, really. Here we go. <laughs> it's great. I 
to swing it? Can I go out and look? Yeah, go <laughs> You know, sometimes this job is so stressful. I just don't know how I'd cope if I wasn't able to relax occasionally. You know, speed trial cycling, regular pole vaulting, oh, and of course, ice skating. That's how I dump the stress. Oh, yeah, and lumbering you lot with impossible riddles as well. That does me the world of good. What do you think might be the historical thread that connects frozen Fenland rivers in the depths of winter, and those frozen, startled-looking poses that people seem to adopt in Victorian portrait photographs. And if you're wondering why I'm dressed up in the Peterborough Pirates ice hockey outfit, that's a bit of a clue. So, frozen rivers and Victorian portrait photographs. Oh, yes, and a silly hat. This is the River Neen at Wisbeach. In the recent past, iron-hard Fenland winters regularly froze the rivers and drains, and Fenlanders flocked like geese to enjoy their days on the ice. Fun and frolic by all means, but there was serious sport as well. You see, throughout skating history, the Fens have produced a crop of champions. Men celebrated not merely for their speed, but also for their dogged determination. Something you need in spades to work this landscape. One famous skating dynasty specialised in bizarre nicknames. William Turkey Smart was the first in a line of great Fen champions. William C was another, with the astonishing racing name of Gutter Percher. But it was Turkey's nephew, James Smart, brother of George Flying Fish Smart, honest. Well, he was the fastest man on ice. And he never had a nickname but he was world champion in 1888. Do you know, there's all sorts of myths and fallacies about how and when skates first arrived in the Fens. So I came to Wisbeach Museum to... <laughs> all right. That's easy, that, you know. Anyone can do that. Of course, I don't, because I'm a serious historian. As I was saying, Wisbeach Museum very kindly lent me some of their skates, and I'll use them to illustrate some of the stories about how they got here. The first one, which is really nonsense, is that the Norman builders of the cathedrals brought skates so they could get around between building projects in the winter. Tosh. The next one, a bit more plausible, the Dutch word for a skate is shat. And they claim that the shat was first introduced by the people who came here to drain the fens, Cornelius Vermoyden and all his gang. Well, that's fine, except that I'm fairly certain bone skates, you know, animal bones, have been around since the Middle Ages. In fact, I'd even put money on them being around in Viking times. So that leaves us with a lovely little story from Southery, where they tell you that in the Middle Ages, a shipwrecked Dutch mariner was rescued by the villagers of Southery, and he was so grateful that he declared himself to be a fine, upstanding blacksmith and he would go on to show them the secrets of shat construction. Now, to this day, there is a little farm just outside Southery called Shat's Home, which means the place of the skate maker. Well, you pays your money and you takes your choice. I think it's probably true. I also believe that Hitler's deputy, Martin Bormann, is alive and well and running the chip shop in Guyhern. But you might want to make your own minds up. So where do those Victorian portrait photographs come in? Well, they come right in here on Wisbeach High Street, because eight and nine, the high street, back in Victorian times, was actually the studios of a leading portrait photographer, John Kenneral. And behind this very sad-looking shop frontage, you can still see the very imposing, grandiose Victorian frontage that was once there. 
And in its heyday, people like Billy Gutter Percher and uh, Turkey Smart would all come here with their kit to have their portraits taken. You know the way these days kids have photographs of their sporting heroes or pop stars stuck on their bedroom walls? Well, back then, it wasn't really that much different. People wanted souvenir photographs of their local heroes, the Fenland skaters. And so these guys would go up to the studio and pose in front of a beautifully painted backdrop for cabinet photographs. So, why cabinet photos? Well, these photos would take pride of place in the China cabinet. The cabinet where people kept and displayed their souvenirs and mementos. All those great and little moments that define our lives. Ready when you are, sir. But what about the hat bit of the riddle? Well, headgear played an important part in competitive skating, and not just to keep your ears warm in a race. The answer, and the evidence, is in the diaries kept throughout the 17 and 1800s by Fenland farmer John Peck. He writes about skating matches and hats. On the 13th of January, some fine snow falling to the depth of half an inch on the levels. In the afternoon, skating on the Shire Drain for a hat. Young Puttrell from St. James, winner of the same. And a prize of 10 guineas run four at March and won by May of Upwell. You see, these guys didn't just race for the fun of it. They often raced for prize money. And when the prize money wasn't forthcoming, well, local tradesmen and shopkeepers were more than happy to put prizes up, a nice form of advertising, if you like. And so people would race for flasks of spirits, cider beef, and time and time again, you find warm hats. To keep the wind out of your ears when it's blowing across the fen. <laughs> What do you think might be the connection between a boozy, belted earl who loved to get drunk as a lord? Or actually, do lords get drunk as commoners? I don't know. Anyway, a boozy, belted earl, a sandwich, and a hippopotamus. <laughs> That'll get you going. <laughs> To have a hope in hell fire club of getting this one, that's a little clue by the way, you need to know about a certain summer holiday spent on the old Neen in the 1700s. For three weeks, a peer of the realm, his mistress and his peers cruised and boozed their way to Peterborough. <laughs> Aristocrats, eh? The sluices there, go. Here we are, yeah. So, we can go Sorry, on. Sorry, Yeah. We... <laughs> 
<laughs> in our dramatic reconstruction, we have three men in a boat. Love that book. Anyway, we have internationally renowned expert on the history of navigation in these parts, H. J. K. Jenkins. So I'm well out of my depth. What's called the stand ground cut. We call it the stand ground cut today. That's that's a local name. And there's the skipper of the local turbo, Dave Cogging. Who knows the water far, far better than the man in the middle in a bit of a muddle with the map? So we're off to recreate Lord Orford's great circumnavigation of the Fens. As their haphazard flotilla of floating gin palaces potted about the place, the adventurers all kept diaries. Skits on the logs kept by people like Captain Cook and other great explorers of the time. That's how we know so much about their jolly little odyssey. Once again, we bring you a meticulously researched, historically accurate representation of that great river voyage. You see, Orford was absolutely determined that this was going to be the last word in luxury river trips. And he had the dosh to be able to ensure it was. He hired himself five Fenland lighters. The first one, they actually rigged up with a rudimentary mast and sail. And then with a combination of chains and ropes, they attached the other four lighters onto the back of it. Now, when it was in the water, it looked for all the world like any of the big commercial barge trains that used to ply the rivers, carrying cargoes like stone and timber and corn. But the cargo on this occasion was going to be substantially different. For starters, the first boat was actually kitted out with berths and cooking facilities for Orford's servants and cooks. The second one was his personal private accommodation for himself and his longtime mistress, Martha Turk. The third boat in the chain, well, that was going to be for his friends and their um, associates, shall we say. The next to last boat was actually going to carry the crew for the front lighter. And the last one, well, that was for carrying stores, and it was also the berth for the hippo. You remember the hippo in the riddle? Well, hippo was actually the horse that pulled the boat along the banks of the river until the bank ran out. And then, like all Fenland river lighter horses, it was trained to hop onto the back boat as it went past. And off the jolly well went. There you go, Dave. It's wet and warm. That's all I'm guaranteeing. This man knew how to party. <laughs> oh, he could have partied this for England. Yeah. Party, yeah. <laughs> party animal, this man was. He was, uh, in many ways, the typical 18th century rake hell, the hard living aristocrat and a terrible boozer on occasion. Yeah, the quantities they got through were astonishing, weren't oh, they? Oh, well, this was the very epoch of, you know, drunk as a lord. Yeah. He could disappear for weeks at a time into sort of uh, alcoholic cloud cuckoo land. Is that where the expression comes from? Do we first start using it then, drunk as a lord? Well, it's certainly round about that period that it becomes very common currency, drunk it's as a lord. It certainly fitted off it, didn't it? <laughs> oh, yes, and his chums, you know. And, of course, presumably that's why people turned out in their hundreds to watch it all go by. It was like the circus coming to town, wasn't it? Well, it was even better than that. This was the establishment of play, you see. Uh, this was the equivalent of Hello! magazine and all the rest of it, you know? Only you could actually see them in the life. And uh, there are stories, for instance, when they were moored on Whittlesey Mere, uh, they were at dinner and uh, all of a sudden they found rows of Fenland faces looking in at them. Small <laughs> boats had come alongside, you see, to look in at the grandees having their meal. So what about the sandwich bit of the riddle? Well, on his way to Peterborough that summer, Lord Orford had planned to rendezvous with another important personage, a kindred spirit from that band of notoriously naughty nobles who formed their Hell Fire Club. First Lord of the Admiralty, John Montague, fourth Earl of Sandwich. And they met at Port Sandwich on the Fenland Lake of Whittlesea Mere. 
So, dear viewer, by bicycle into deepest, darkest Cambridgeshire, in search of the lost lake of Whittlesea. Long ago, swarming with sailing boats in summer and teeming with skaters in winter, but a place today where few have trod, save the intrepid traveller in search of tales to tell. Where's it gone? Of course, the more observant of you will have noticed that there isn't a Whittlesea mirror anymore. So why is that? This is Alan, who knows all about it. <laughs> Say that. Well, it's yes, it's gone. Well, you know um, more about it than I do, put it that way. <laughs> um, there were several of these mirrors around. They're, they're post-glacial lakes, and um, gradually over the centuries they, they dried up. So uh, when the glaciers went back, they just left the water? They left this yeah. water, um, and um, you can see driving out across the bed of the mirror now, it's a, it's a chalky marl, it's not peat. Um, but yes, it, it dried up progressively over the centuries and by the beginning of the 19th century, uh, it did actually completely dry out in very dry years, causing great consternation locally, um, smell of dead fish and um, uh, you know, rotting, <laughs> rotting vegetation and so forth. So the days of the big regattas and, and Lord Samage coming up and swanning around with his mates, they'd all... They'd all but disappeared. They, they, they had, yes, yes. It was quite difficult to get a boat across the mere uh, by that time. Because that's yeah. what, 1851 is the great exhibition, isn't it? Yes, yes, and I think the mere was drained 1852, so... Yeah. Yeah. This, this was a, a big Victorian shindig, really, to show off to the rest of the world how wonderful British production was. Things like pumps and iron yeah. girders yeah. and what have yeah. you and the Crystal yeah. Palace. Yeah. But some of it finished up here, didn't it? Yeah, well, so they say. The famous post. The famous <laughs> post, yes. The post here on, on the right, um, some say, was, was one of the support pillars of the, the exhibition Palace, building. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, there was a, a, a man called uh, Hutchinson who um, did a study in the, the early 80s of, of the shrinkage here and the, the, where the post had come from. And his view was that it hadn't actually come from there and it was found at a, at a farm uh, nearby. And, and brought here, so not well, quite so romantic. I wish but... to know that. <laughs> <laughs> it was put in in 1852 by William Wells, who was the local squire here, um, who could see that with the draining of the mere and the draining of the fields round, that something might happen to the peat. And so they piled down into the clay which underlies the peat and set the post on top with its top level with the ground surface. The top of that post was level with the ground? It was level with the ground, yeah. So yeah. we're looking at what? 10, 11 feet of shrinkage? Uh, about 13 feet now, I think, yeah. 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 I mean, that's the height of a double-decker bus, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, there's nowhere in, feet. Yeah. There's nowhere in yeah. the world you can see soil erosion on this scale, uh, um, which has been marked so accurately. It's quite scary in one way, isn't it? It is, really. Um, when you think how much soil has been lost, um, OK, lots of crops have been produced in the interim, but now, of course, there's very little peat left in, in some places on the fens. Well, they're down to the clay in a lot yes, of places, yeah. aren't they? Mm -hmm. yep. While the mere and the fen and the peat and port sandwich have all disappeared, John Montague left us a more substantial and sustaining legacy. Apart from sailing, another of Sandwich's passions was gambling. But even gamesters have to eat. So to avoid having to leave the table in the middle of an important game, he asked for some meat to be slapped between two pieces of bread and brought to the table. He'd invented the world's first sandwich. And given that he enjoyed several bottles of Bordeaux whilst he was at play, he went on to invent Paul's tubing. It's a joke. Ask a nurse. Right, next week it's onwards and upwards along the Neen. I'll be handling precious stones, telling the tale of a beautiful bridge and a bale of hay, and blundering through the buttercups to solve the mystery of the lantern tower. Don't miss it.